Hello, good evening and welcome to the latest UK Crime Book Club chat and I'm joined this evening by Tom Hindle. Thank you very much for joining us, Tom. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Tom has written two books, The Fatal Crossing, which you can see just behind my shoulder there, strategically placed before, and The Murder Game, which we're going to talk about this evening. And, and also, um, we can talk about A Fatal Crossing as well. If anybody who's watching would like to talk about that, you can send in some questions via the chat, and I will endeavour to ask as many as I can as well. So, Tom, um, this is your second book, um, and you um, are you a full time writer now, or are you are you still part time? Um, so, I'm a full time writer, but I guess only part time author, if that makes sense. So, I spend half of my time doing kind of freelance copywriting jobs, uh, okay. um, and then half of my time uh, working on books. Probably a bit more than half my time working on books, actually. But, um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so I'm writing full time, but only about half of that is spent writing. About it's your day job this. and your night job, sort of thing. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah, yeah. So. Um, uh, the murder game would you like to tell us about it in your own words what it's all about and um sort of where it came from yeah absolutely so the murder game um is well so the setting it's it's new year's eve in uh, in the fictional town of hamlet wick which is uh, on the north devon coast and to mark the occasion uh, hamlet hall which is an old stately home now a, a hotel that's seen better days is hosting a murder mystery dinner party um, and a load of guests from <clears throat> the local area have turned out to to take part in it um, there's a bit of they're all there for a good time but there is a bit of tension there's uh, some horrible mm -hmm. things have happened in hamlet wick over the years and uh, everyone has a bit of a a stake in it and everyone is a little bit traumatized in different ways and uh, there's there's a lot of history in this place but they're all turning out for this dinner party to have a good time and then a final guest turns up uh, a chap called damian white who is just nothing but bad news everyone has a reason to hate this guy he turns up out of nowhere no one's invited him no one's expecting him but he turns up to take part in this dinner party um and predictably he turns up dead quite soon uh, after he's arrived and they're in the middle of nowhere, there's no phone signal, um, the police are all busy because it's New Year's Eve and they're stuck in this house and one of them has to be the killer. Um, in terms of where it came from, I was taking part in, this is a few years ago now, so I used to live in Reading and uh, there was a company, I forget what they're called, but they used to be these amazing detective like games around Reading. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way it would work is you'd go with like a team, like it'd usually be you know, me and a couple of friends and my wife. And we would um, you'd be told such and such a person has been murdered. There are clues all around town and there are actors in bars and cafes and things if you can find them. And they'll they'll uh, they'll give you information and you've got to go and find as much information as you can and come back in three hours and tell us who you think did it. And they were just brilliant. We did about three or four of those and they were so, so yeah. good. And I was going around doing doing one of them. And um, I mean, I'd just about finished a Fatal Crossing at that point. So I was looking for an idea for my next my next book. I was looking for interesting places to host murder mysteries. And uh, yeah, we were on the way around in Reading doing one of these detective games. And uh, it occurred to me, I think when we got home, rather than half around, yeah, when we got home, it occurred to me, if someone had got murdered during that game like not not what if the crime we were investigating was real what if someone playing the game was murdered midway through that could be a really interesting <laughs> setup for a murder mystery i just it felt very meta the idea of the murder mystery within the murder yeah. mystery um I like that, yeah. and uh, and then it snowballed from there and you know had to make some adjustments like i i wanted a a very isolated setting with a you know a very limited number of people involved mm. um and that was kind of how i ended up you know in the west country in this or this old hotel in a very remote part of the county um but yeah but that's but that's where it came from and yeah i say the idea just snowballed from there into into the book as we see it today well being from devon myself i really loved the devon connection and, and i was intrigued about the lighthouse because there is a there is a lighthouse um that's being has been converted mm. um a big grand designs place up in north uh, really? 
up in North Devon, yes. Wow. Um, and it didn't have a very happy ending. Not a, not as bad as your ending, but <laughs> uh, yeah. If you like, have a look at, and, and I did think, oh, I wonder if it was that, but actually, it's not. Is it? It's not. It's it's. It's not so the lighthouse is the reason I had to make up the location actually so it's based very heavily on a place I used to so when I was so I'm from Leeds originally um and when I was growing up every summer we would go for a week to Exmoor and mm -hmm. uh, we'd have our kind of our holiday down there and it was just amazing I used to love those holidays like it's still today one of my favorite places and there's a really lovely little place called Porlock um and oh, Porlock yeah. Weir, Porlock which, Weir yeah. yeah that's right and um, I, I really liked the idea because, I mean, that's, you know, it's on the coast it is a bit of a trek to get to if you're not sort of already in Devon. Um, and it's a really nice, just to kind of describe it for people who haven't been. So you have Porlock, which is like a little town, and then you have Porlock Weir. And Porlock Weir is like the harbour and there is like a pub and a hotel and a few little houses there. But it's it's a couple of miles away down this really narrow track that you have to go down with tall hedges on either side. And I really loved how kind of remote Porlock Weir felt. And I have this you know, personal connection, historical connection to it as well. So I really, really thought about setting it in Porlock Weir and just doing that. But then, yeah. you know, as I was, I was, I was working out what the story was going to be, the idea of this lighthouse became quite integral and Porlock Weir doesn't have a lighthouse. Um, so I, I, I toyed with the idea of making up a Porlock Weir lighthouse. So just setting it there, yeah. but just pretending there was a lighthouse there. But then I just thought, you know, if anyone uh, who knows Paul Queer yeah. reads this, they're going to write to me and say, you've got this, <laughs> you've got this wrong, so wrong. describe <laughs> our home incorrectly. So I thought the safest thing to do was just make up, make up a place, which is where Hamlet Wick came from. But it is very, very heavily based on uh, on Paul Lock and on Paul Queer. Yeah, no, I, I really like, I mean, it's obviously coming from the area, it's it's nice to have that sort of connection. And I think it made it, when I was reading it, I could very much imagine it was a sort of in a Devon, you know, sort of that remote, like New Year's always either raining or bleak yeah. or something. <laughs> oh, it's nice to hear. I mean, this is it. Like, I don't, you know, I, I spent a lot of time there growing up every, you know, a week, every summer. But um, yeah, you know, I nev I've never lived there. So I would like to one day, but I haven't lived there. So to hear from someone who who knows the place even better than I do that that came through. Yeah. That's really nice to hear. No, it's really good. Um, and I, I wasn't sure whether we were going to give away who was murdered first, but obviously you, oh. uh, it's, but that's fine because <laughs> if you've done it, I haven't. So that's I think okay. it's on the cover of the book, isn't it? I might have made that up. I thought it was in the blurb or oh, oh, apologies. I think it's, it's, I mean, it happens very quickly anyway. When <laughs> I did my review, I said it happens very quickly. So, yes. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a huge spoiler. Um, but my first question really is to sort of say everybody has a motive, don't they? In they that do. group of nine people. So there's nine people. Um, there's the couples who've been invited mm -hmm. and then there's the actors mm -hmm. and then there's the, the, the other two. <laughs> um, how difficult was it to decide who the killer was going to be? Did, did that come quite quickly or, or was it as you sort of progressed, you thought, you know, so you, did you know that Damien was going to be murdered first or did all these things sort of change and then the killer came? So I have to know who the victim and the killer is like at all times. I'd like, I, I it's interesting listening to people who write, um, who set off writing these murder mysteries with no idea as to who the killer mm. is. And they talk about discovering it along with the characters <laughs> as they're writing. I, I can't do that. <laughs> Like I'd love to be able to do that because I think it would uh, it'd be an interesting way of doing it. But no, I I have to know what I'm building to, which is um, the the killer being revealed and it being a certain person. So I mean, mm. the way I I guess I kind of come up with these is I so I have that that detail as my beginning. You know, this is the victim, this is the murderer, and then I kind of reverse engineer it and try and work out well, who else would this person have in their lives the victim that is yeah. you know who else would would realistically have motives to want to to kill them and then you build in kind of the layers and the story and it, it kind of goes from there but no i i have to know from the very beginning who the killer is going to be because otherwise i just feel like i'm i don't know i just feel like i'm in the dark a little bit um as yeah, long as i, I, I think it's really fascinating how people say you know they let their characters do as they want to do yeah and I think that's you know really clever if you can do that but I I think I'd be the same as you I think I would have to I'm a bit, a bit of a control freak so I would definitely need to know <laughs> who well, it I think, was 
there's there's still i mean i so i say i know who the killer is but i kind of let the characters work out themselves yeah so um i i don't know it sounds very pretentious but i guess i'm kind of following them along for the investigation but i'm still yeah. the one who tells them how that investigation yeah, ends. How they're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. you will do what i tell you to do yeah, yeah indeed and i think it made the story really interesting that you know everybody has a reason as you said some bad things have happened at uh at Ham hamlet wick and and uh over a, over a long period it's not just you know there's there's two major incidents that have happened isn't there so um and it was quite i think i liked that because i like to when i'm reading a book i like to not know who's done it um and i you did keep me guessing excellent that's what so, we like to hear yeah <laughs> um so is it difficult when you're writing the story to give enough away but not too much I've, I always think that's quite must be quite a skill because if you you have to sort of plant the seeds for people who want to yeah. solve it but also you want to make it difficult enough so you don't guess it on page 30. <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely right I mean it, it is difficult um and it is something you know there'll be because usually it's like it's a really small detail or like a throwaway line that ends up solving the case and yeah you do always go back and forth in your mind a little yeah. bit over oh, is that you know is that too much is it not enough but I mean I, I always get a few people obviously to read these books before mm. they go out into the world so um yeah my wife will read it I've got a few friends who I'll, I'll ask to read it my agent reads it of course and if ever any of them um work it out I always ask them at what point did you work it out because then I know I've got to go back and and yeah. change that bit but I mean it quite often I mean, these things go through a, quite a few rounds of edits. So quite yeah. often you don't um, really iron those out until that final round of edits because things change mm -hmm. along the way. And I guess you don't want to get too caught up on the way something's worded if you're going to have to change how that sentence is worded yeah. in a, a couple of drafts time. So, yes, you are conscious of it all the way through. I mean, one <clears throat> one kind of trick, I suppose, is to... Um, so every every chapter has to kind of reveal something new right about the investigation mm. I guess you kind of try and fool your reader by letting them think ah this is what I've learned from this chapter I've picked up this clue or this piece of information and at the same time you've managed to slip this also very important information piece of information in under their noses so they've picked it up but they're they're looking at something else and they think that's what they should have yeah. picked up and then you remind them of what you kind of subtly showed them later on so i guess there's a bit of sleight of hand involved but yeah there are there are tricks like that that you can use to uh, to make sure it works but yeah it is it's definitely something you kind of go back and forth over in your head and you said about like the editing and things as well so you know have you ever had in either of your books have you ever had something change so dramatically that you have that you've thought I really don't want to change that because it's massive or have, is, have is the editing pro <laughs> I or mean, it be usually kind? um I find so editing's editing's a funny one like you get back your edits from kind of your editor or your agent or you know whoever it is that is that's reviewing it and your immediate reaction to everything is no <laughs> Just <laughs> everything you go through it I mean like I so the way I I have to give myself 48 hours before I start any edits like it's just a kind of a rule I have for myself because you look yeah. at every every comment and every suggestion and you do think oh they they just haven't understood that or they aren't seeing they aren't realizing what the bigger picture yeah. is or whatever and then two day you know a day or two later you always do find yourself thinking oh god they're absolutely right actually yeah. <laughs> that does need changing <laughs> well, um... fail, that is I mean I know yeah. I've only done two books but like with every suggestion I've been given more or less in you know every round of edits on both of those books that has been the response it's initially nope not doing that and then a day later it's like oh yeah they're actually quite right yeah. about that but the biggest one um so with a fatal crossing um there was only one murder in that in the very first draft so um i don't think it's a spoiler to say you have well so you have the dead body that's found in the very first chapter yeah. um and then there is another murder or indeed murders without wanting to give spoilers away later on in the book um but that first murder was the only one um and it was my editor who said 
we need ideally we need another murder kind of halfway through ish yeah. to uh to kind of keep Come on, the pace kill going. somebody else off <laughs> <laughs> um and i i push back against that really hard actually i remember just thinking that's just too big it's just too much of a change how yeah. am i gonna work out how to get another murder in and pull it off um and i think i resisted that for about a month or two actually and then i think it was over christmas it hit me that there was a way to make it work and actually it would make yeah. the story better and i remember just thinking ah crap i've got to admit that i was wrong <laughs> about that because i pushed back quite hard like i mean you know nicely but i had said yeah. this just isn't the right thing to do i just don't feel good about it um and then yeah two months later i had to come back and say oh sorry actually yes you were you were right <laughs> i know how i'm gonna fit another murder in now and it is gonna make it better so yes in answer to a question yes there are big things but with edits as I say, just never try to edit while you're annoyed with a suggestion. You've got to say like, right, that email, isn't it? When mm. you get when you cross, yes, put it in exactly. your inbox and leave leave it for the next day, and then come back to it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's tricky. Awesome. Like you know, yeah. you've worked for months, maybe years on something, and then someone you know reads it and says this isn't working or that isn't mm. working. You yeah, your your first reaction is always going to be, well, no, I know yeah. this piece of work best, and <laughs> you know, I I know that 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 suggestion isn't right, but then. When you're so attached to it, you just can't quite see for yourself without being told when something isn't working. So, yeah, it it is a tricky one, but you know, editors do what they do for a reason, and they are nearly always right. So, yeah, yeah, it is something you hear. You know, people do, and I think it's really difficult to not take something that you've spent hours and hours of your life on. Yeah. Personally, and I particularly with book one, I imagine is that book one is always you write it over a longer period because you haven't got the deadline and you know some people have said that it's taken years for them to write book one so that sort of emotional investment in it must be even more so with book one than it is with with other books I imagine probably yeah I think as well because book one is also it's just a passion project at that point yeah. like it's um you know when you don't have an agent and an editor and you know a publisher waiting for it it's just you and your laptop and this story that you are creating out of sheer force of will you know <laughs> um and yeah so yeah I, I can totally see how with book one it is harder um and then but as well with the first one like people might do more research than I did which I would encourage <laughs> and have a better <laughs> idea of how the process works but um yeah like with book two I know I guess and book three which I'm working on now I know to be slightly less attached because I understand mm. how the process works now and I understand that this is just how it is um but yeah but with book one when you're doing it all for the first time and you're trying to work out how to do everything and how to feel about everything then yeah, yeah when someone's saying to you okay here's a list of changes to go and make please and <laughs> that is, no. it is slightly trickier yeah um I've got some questions um that come in we've got somebody who I can't see the name but they they went to uh Paul Lockweir they oh, wonderful the, um Caroline's asking if you've got any plans to set a novel in Leeds if that's where you grew up uh no plans I, but I think <laughs> only because um I because of the kind of stories that I write I suppose these murder mysteries these whodunits I like locations that are quite remote um yeah. and Leeds is quite a large city <laughs> there aren't many there aren't many kind of remote places in Leeds um I, I got very far in actually to planning a story that was set in a very rural remote part of Yorkshire um and that uh, that point that could have been book number three um but the reality is i i stumbled on an idea for book number three that i just loved even more so that idea went back back uh, on the shelf but i you know i'm i might well write something that's that's set in yorkshire one day i might revisit that idea because it wasn't a bad idea but what i am doing for book three just excited me more we'll come back to that in a minute uh, so um laura's saying sometimes it's okay to work it out early this is like the plot um mm. it's interesting to follow the story to see if you're right also might guess who did it but not exactly how so yeah, yeah. well yeah. It, i mean like again not wanting to be spoilery but i've had a few i've seen a few reviews of the murder game people saying they've worked out who but not why or how um and that kind of irritates me a little bit because <laughs> you don't <laughs> you don't want people to work out who but um but then as i say you read the rest of the review or you you have a chance to chat with these people and they say well you know i just i i just kind of had a sense that it was this person but i didn't work out this or this or this or this and i stand and, and they as you say still enjoy the journey and getting to the end and realizing 
how it was done and okay you might have had a sense that it was this person but you didn't pick up all the clues that would have explained why they were doing it um mm -hmm. so yeah as you say there is definitely something to be said for enjoying the journey i think there's something to be said as well for endings being um kind of what you expect them to be like i mean i think when you try really hard to subvert expectations and just pull an ending that just doesn't work but does just in the interest of surprising people i think people would rather have an ending that that makes sense but perhaps they saw coming but is still fulfilling and um and leaves them you know feeling satisfied with the story so yeah i think there's definitely something to be said for just enjoying enjoying being part of the ride but i think you know the, the books the sort of whodunits we all sort of you know we know that you know we know the sort of the plot don't we of you know there's going to be a murder and there's going to be certain people and da, 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 and we're going to be not be able to do certain things and and that's what we love that's why i read mm -hmm. them you know i i think that's why everybody likes the you know particularly the sort of locked room genre which i really love um mm -hmm. you know that's what we want we want that sort of book so that's why we read it so yeah. i think yeah i think i've read very <laughs> few books where like there's been a surprise where you've gone well where did that come from and it just doesn't fit because it's a shocker rather than a yeah and yeah and I think that's fine in some books but in in these I think you know I think it's it's good to know where you're going and you yeah know. completely agree um so I had my favorite character I really like Lily I thought she okay was, yeah I can see um, that I um I like Will as well actually although Will's <laughs> Will's quite interesting. We he's were, a complicated guy. Yeah, he's a very complicated guy, but he was quite funny in a sort of. I mean, he, he's obviously had a really awful time. Yeah, but I liked his ending. <laughs> I'm glad. I mean, Will was a really tricky one to um, to work out because he is the one who sets up this murder mystery party, and he does it. Yeah. I mean, we we find out why, um, but just trying to. Just trying to pin down the the why as to um you know the, the very first time we see will kind of in the opening pages of the book we realize something quite traumatic happened to him yeah uh, when when he was very young and um and we we see it's quite clearly stayed with him and trying to work out um try to take that you know that traumatic event and work work out why he would then want to host this murder mystery party in the way that he does that was really tricky actually and i was i was quite worried that people wouldn't buy into his reasoning for do it like i remember writing it and just thinking this makes sense to me but are people just gonna go no i really liked him i yeah. i thought i could see why he was doing it mm. but i did you know obviously like everybody i did think has he got the motive and then I was like well I'm, I'm not sure he was too obvious because sure yeah um so I thought no maybe not it wasn't him and he definitely he sort of definitely crossed my mind because when he re you know when he's reading out the mm. you know and everybody else in the party thinks he's got something to do with it yes and that see that that I found that very appealing actually the idea of everyone thinks it's probably him um yeah. just because I think so often with these stories I think the detective can be a little bit detached in that the person solving the crime is someone who yeah. kind of arrives and is meeting everyone for the first time and has nothing to do with what's going on. They are just there to solve this mystery. Whereas Will and Lily as well, um, yeah. both of them are very, you know, personally invested in what's yeah. happening here. And, uh, you know, Lily, um, of course, it's it's her dad and she's trying to work out who's who's killed her dad yeah. whereas will is trying to work it all out because everyone thinks it's him and why wouldn't yeah, they exactly. what he's done is completely <laughs> nuts um so yeah that was that that was something that really really appealed to me quite early on was the idea that these these two people are are really invested and it was gonna so the the structure of the murder game is gonna be really different actually when i first started writing it so the first so, I mean, you'll see all the way throughout, we're flitting between the perspectives of different characters and the whole book yeah. takes place over this one night. Um, at first, when I first started planning the murder game out, it was going to be a book of two halves. And uh, the first half was going to be all Will. And um, it was going to be kind of what was happening in Hamlet Hall. And it was going to get to midnight. And midnight was going to be the midpoint of the book. And the police were going to come and take Will away. And he was going to go to prison. And we were going to uh, jump to Lily. And it was going to be set about a month later. And the second half was going to be Lily 
um, realizing this isn't quite right. I don't think Will did it. And then she comes back to Hamlet Wick and spends the second half of the book working it out. But it just it, it just didn't work for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest of which was that why is Lily the only one who can see that it isn't Will? I, that just didn't <laughs> seem believable. And then, yeah, I, I mean, what was really challenging about the murder game actually was because it all happens in this one night, you've got this very compressed space of time um yeah. and that was where the, the the split perspectives came from actually it was because when it was just will um it was just okay this happens and then this happens and then this happens yeah. and it just it, the pacing was just completely off and i realized you're gonna have to jump between the different perspectives the whole way through the book just to make sure it doesn't feel like will wanted to do this so off he went yeah. <laughs> and then he wanted yeah it just yeah um but yes yeah, so the murder game was going to look very different but yeah mm -hmm. I mean, i've gone very off 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 topic no no, no it's but, fine uh, i was gonna say so because you have the timings don't you in the chapters the chapters because yes. because actually because it is set over one night it's very difficult to not lose track of the time because as you said so much happens yeah in that and i was um I finished it last night because I always like to read the last bit just before I interview, just so I don't. And I was like, oh, so that's, you know, that's the time, you know, it's, mm. it's, th there is a lot in yeah. this, in this time. A lot in this happens. Period. Yeah, it's a busy um, night. <laughs> yeah, I mean, right. those, those time markers were just for me. Like, I mean, at first when I was, when I was writing it, I just had those there so that I knew what time it was. And I think as I was getting nearer to the end of the first draft, like my plan was to go back and just delete those. So, yeah. um, yeah, as you say, every now and then you'll reach a page in the book that is just nine o'clock and then 50 pages later, it's just 10 o'clock and whatever. Yeah, my, yeah. my plan was absolutely to go back and delete those. because no, I like them. Me, I, but I did like them. Yeah, yeah, I think I just realized at the end of that first draft, people are going to need this or they're just not going to realize <laughs> what time it is, which. Yeah, is or what but it's on. Because I think it's important, isn't it, that you know f that it is in in one night when you yeah. when you find out the end, <laughs> which yes, we're not going to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> um, it yeah, you, it sort of all comes together. I could definitely see it as a as a TV show or a book. Oh, like, definitely. Have you thought about um, who would play characters? I was trying to I was trying to think of who would be Damien White. And I could only think of, I was trying to think of a baddie that I, mm -hmm. that, and I could think of the guy that plays, oh, and I can't remember his name, the face of the guy that plays Prince Philip in The Crown, the one with Olivia Coleman. I, oh, I know who you mean. Oh, maybe. He's a bit older than I was imagining. So I, for me, for me, <laughs> Damien, for me, Damien White is Paul Hollywood. <laughs> like, that's kind of, oh, that's, really? that's kind of who I'm imagining. Well, Silver Fox. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think Paul Hollywood, um, I don't know if, if Paul Hollywood can act, but I think Damien White looks a bit like Paul Hollywood. Well, he's not going to have to act for long, is he? Well, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah but no I do I do think about who would play the characters um just because I I think I, I I'm a very visual writer like I, yeah. I have to see something in my head to be able to write it down and um that is just so much easier when I know what all the characters look like so sometimes most well most of the time it's an actor um occasionally a character looks like someone I know uh, like there's I think there are one or oh, two yeah. characters in a fatal crossing who um I you know I in my head they look like people i know or have known very important i clarify they are not based on them as people <laughs> <laughs> like because that way disaster lies i think once you start Absolutely. writing real people into your books but yes yeah. um i so i do know who would play most if not all of them um but i probably won't say too much you know because we, we do live in hope that it might get picked up <laughs> one day and i don't want yeah. whoever does play those parts to be uh to be discouraged to find that they're not my <laughs> dream but yeah that's but yeah I, I do I do have an idea no because I, I was interested with um like Marth, Marth, Martha and Gwen I was like you know um I was like oh I wonder what they would look like I was sort of mm. thinking they were sort of because who I can't the one that wears all the sort of feather boa and Sylvia yeah Sylvia that's it yes yes um yeah I was thinking about her but I they are very visual characters actually you can sort of I think it, it's quite interesting that you say your visual because some people don't have any idea what their characters look like and I right. think I would have to know what mine look like because mm. well, I think with a whodunit as well because you've got all these 
I don't know, quite often with a whodunit, and a, a Fatal Crossing does this a little bit, you'll, you'll kind of meet a character um, for like a chapter and mm -hmm. they'll give like an interview or something like that. And then you move on and you meet another character and they give their interview and you probably don't see them again until the end when you all come together and work out who the killer is. And I think making those characters very visual and very distinct and just feel very separate from each other um, yeah. is, is quite important so that the reader just remembers who everyone is. <laughs> so yeah. when they come together at the end, you can say, oh, yeah, Sylvia, she's the one with that ridiculous feather boa or boa. whatever. <laughs> but as well, when you only see these guys for, you know, a snapshot of the book, um, then you need to kind of do as much as you can to establish mm. them as characters. And a big part of that is, uh, is kind of how do they dress? How do they behave? How do they move around in the space? How do they interact with people? Um, so it becomes very, very visual in that regard, just to make the absolute most of the time that you you have with them. Um, but no, but I mean, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you you could sort of see them. That that shows yeah, up definitely. in my job properly. <laughs> I do like, I mean, I, I, when I read a book, I like to be able to be there, if you know what I mean by mm. that, you know, I like to be able to picture who they are, where it is. So like I said, I could do the Devon and I had the people, yeah. I'm not sure that they were, that they were particularly famous people. They were just people mm. <laughs> in my head. But, um, but yeah, no, definitely I could, uh, did you have a favourite character? Did you, when you were writing it, did you have a favourite to write? I think Lily probably became my favourite character. Um, if only yeah. because I think she was supposed to be almost a supporting character and she ended up kind of by accident. I mean, this is what I say. Like, I know I know who the killer and the victim is going to oh. be and I kind of follow the investigation with the characters to get there. Um, and Lily sort of ends up becoming the detective in a way. Um, it does, which, yeah. Which I wasn't really expecting. Like, I thought it was going to be Will. And it is Will. Like, Will is trying as well to, yeah. to work out who's done it so that he can save his own save his own skin. Yes, but Lily so does skin. end up becoming um, the detective, which which I enjoyed. Um, I like, I enjoyed writing Damien White for the short time that he appears, just because he's such yeah. a nasty piece of work. Um, he is and really a nasty piece of work. He really he? is. And, like, all of these characters just hate him and he knows it and he doesn't care and he likes to wind them up and make them all unhappy and that was that was a lot of fun to write um yeah. i kind of I, I i i sort of enjoyed writing justin as well like the the reporter yeah like, the reporter yeah mm. yeah because he was a bit he wasn't very nice was he he wasn't but i can totally <laughs> see kind of in a way where he's coming from like all he wants is to just go and have the what he perceives to be this big glitzy news reporter yeah. in london kind of job and he's just doing anything he can to yeah. get the scoop that will get him that job and um yeah again not you know perhaps not the nicest of people but um but an interesting one to write just because you know he really will push the limit to try and to try and get yeah. what he thinks is going to help get, get him out of the wick so yeah he was a fun one to write but in terms of favorite character it's probably it's probably got to be got to be lily i think yeah, no, I like Lily. She was my favourite. I think because she, because in the beginning, I think, as you said, she, she does start off by, you know, she comes along with her dad mm -hmm. and, you know, you don't know that's gonna, what's going to happen to her dad. And yeah. But she does, you know, she becomes her own sort of person and her own mm. sort of, you know, I yeah. Think, I, I, yeah, I think that's what she, why she, I was drawn to her. Um, So with your your writing career now yep. do you have a routine do you have like a so i do it and it's a lot more civilized than my routine used to be so my routine <laughs> used to be i would get up at um at six every morning and i would do an hour or so's work um on on my books and then it would just be hop into the shower super quick shower super quick breakfast in the car drive to the office uh and do do a day's work at the office and then maybe do a little bit more book when i got home if mm. i was still awake so that was that was my routine before and then last last year last july i um i, I left that job after six or seven years and i started doing what i'm doing now which is yeah about 50 percent freelance copywriting and 50 percent being being an author which is wonderful so my routine now is more um so my alarm goes off at seven instead of six which is which is very nice <laughs> and uh, uh yeah. i get kind of you know my my shower and my breakfast and stuff done first and then i'm at my desk usually by about 
I don't know, quarter to eight, eight o'clock, something like that. And then I try and stay there until sometime between five and six. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are a few kind of, uh, uh, a few things I build into that routine just to mix it up. So sometimes if I'm really stuck, I'll go for a walk in the afternoon and that's kind of become half past two. And I don't quite know <laughs> why, why that, <laughs> has, cool. that happened yeah. at half past two, but for some reason I'm always so stuck. I need to go on a walk at half past two. So that happens, um, I don't know, once every couple of weeks or so um i live near oxford so i try and there's a there's a wa- really big waterstones in oxford that has a wonderful cafe on the top floor nice. um and i try and go there i don't know once a week just to try and spend an afternoon working somewhere yeah. a little different and just be around some people and you know get out of the house i suppose um yeah. So, yeah, so if anyone follows me on Instagram and sees every now and then an Instagram story of a, <laughs> of a lovely view from a top floor building, that's usually Waterstones, Oxford. Um, but, yeah, but that's that's kind of it. So um, it's it's pretty quiet. Um, my you know, my wife works from home three days a week and we share an office. So I'm at my desk right now and uh, and her desk is just to the left of mine. So it's, you know, three days a week. It's just the two of us in here and then yeah two days a week it's just me um, that's nice rather than being mm. on your own because it can be quite isolating can't it being you know sort yeah of... it can it can I mean it was it, I, it was a bit of a well I don't know it wasn't as much of a shock to the system as I suppose it could have been last summer so I, I used to work mm. for a PR agency and um that was just such a busy bustling yeah. environment always something going on you know there was music on all the time always people to talk to everyone going out on lunchtime walks and whatever and it was it was a really fun environment to be in but I think with lockdown um mm. you know for two years I'm working from home for two years you know anyway because we, we couldn't go into the office um I think that meant that last summer it probably wasn't as much of a shock to the system as it could have been but you are absolutely right you know every now and then it can be quite isolating and that is why I try mm. and go you know into town and sit in yeah and just sit with other people yeah exactly I mean, that's, yeah lots of people do that I think lockdown definitely changed sort of people's perceptions of working mm. at home didn't they it wasn't oh, it did. really yeah. it was really only sort of authors and people who were sort of had their own business before and now it's you know yeah. lots of people do it so I think you know it's uh it's become less isolating but yeah. uh, you know you yeah. do see you know waterstones and cafes and things yes. they all have their they're all busy aren't they <laughs> I enjoy it though I think I probably should clarify I, I do I do enjoy it and I'm very yeah. grateful that I get the opportunity to to do it as I do because I mean I've I mean I, it's really cheesy but there's I think I saw an Instagram quote like I don't know a few years ago <laughs> and it was um it was something like never regret where you are now because five years ago is probably all you wanted and uh I I, I remember reading that at the time and just thinking like that is just yeah. <laughs> so naff um but yeah. now that I'm kind of here and I you know I have yeah. the opportunity to do this I do quite often look back and think of those early mornings spent writing a fatal crossing before work when I didn't have an agent and I didn't have a publisher and I was kind of I guess dreaming of uh, living the life I'm living now so yeah yeah, it's you know it can it can be quiet and it can be isolating sometimes but I you know I don't I'm always trying very hard to make sure I'm grateful for it. Mm, Definitely was the murder game more difficult to write as your second book is it was it harder because you know we talked about that sort of you know it was mm. the, the passion project and you know did you have was it a, I don't know if you um do you did you have like a two book deal or something like that so you had to like a deadline or so we had a one book deal for a fatal crossing um yeah. uh, but I think there was there was some clause in the deal that said you know the publisher would you know get the first refusal on the murder game or it was something like that um I can't yeah. remember exactly what the wording was but it wasn't it was essentially a one but you know just a fatal crossing yeah but we absolutely want to see what you come out with next was was the deal more or less um in terms of whether it was more difficult it's I think different challenges um I, as you say I turned it around in a much shorter space of time so a fatal crossing because I was only working on that a few days a week and it was a hobby and yeah. um you know that that took about 18 months to write the first draft and it was a bit longer actually a fatal crossing ended up being about 110,000 words and the murder game mm. is about 85,000 words so quite a bit longer um but yeah but different challenges i mean um i think 
So with a facial crossing, like researching the period detail and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, like I remember I spent an hour trying to work out if you watch Titanic or something and you see yeah. the big lengths of like rope suspended between like the funnel yeah. and the deck. I spent an hour one morning trying to work out <laughs> if that was called rigging or if it was called something else. And after I'd worked that out, I had to try and work out, are they even funnels or should I be saying chimneys? Um, so there was that. And obviously I didn't have to do that with the murder game. Um, I think with the murder game, mobile phones, oh my goodness, trying to like make sure no one could just Google who is the killer. <laughs> like that was, yeah. that was a bit of a nightmare. Um, and that was again, why, why Devon really appealed was because, you know, having mm. spent a lot of time there and in poor lot queer specifically myself. I was going to say particularly small, there's no signal. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Again, I think the murder game, a challenge I didn't have of a fatal crossing was trying to make sure the police didn't just turn up. Um, like, mm -hmm. you know, the police can't just yeah. rock up um, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, but they can just rock up in Devon, even in the more remote, remote <laughs> parts of the county. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was where New Year's Eve came from. And, you know, we, we were fortunate. I have a family member who has actually worked for the police in Devon and was able to talk to me a bit about how procedure would be affected on new year's eve and how it might take slightly longer for a police officer to come out because it's like the busiest night of the year apart from halloween it's funny what you learn doing this um but yeah so like, challenges like that different challenges and then the pacing of the murder game was a real challenge as i say like it was mm -hmm. going to be a book of the first half was just will second half was just um was just lily and the pacing just did not work there at all so just trying yeah. to work out how to make that work instead i remember being i remember being quite worried actually about the the whole thing happening in one night i just thought is this gonna work does it just feel too quick um and yeah trying to make sure that that you know that you had that pace and that it was clear yeah. this was all happening in one night but also that it didn't feel like the mystery was just over 10 minutes after it had begun yeah so so that was tricky because yeah fatal crossing played out over a week um so yeah, I think um, I, I think different challenges, to be honest. Um, and I don't know if one was more challenging. I think I don't. I think the Fatal Crossing was probably slightly more challenging, actually. Um, Interesting. But I don't know if maybe I was just more determined with the murder game because I knew, <laughs> say, I knew there was an agent and hopefully a publisher waiting for it. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah but I um, mean, challenging in their own in their own ways, I suppose. In their own ways, yeah, definitely. Um, so Laura sort of said she's tries doesn't she tries not to cast actors um, for characters after casting Ian Glenn and Keely Hawes in a book, and Keely Hawes then murdered Ian Glenn's character in a pr particularly disgusting way. Oh, <laughs> Keely, I mean, uh, to be fair, I said Keely Hawes is a great shout for Gwen actually for people who yeah. are reading the book. Um, but yeah, yeah, she would actually, yeah, she would because she's got that sort of. Yeah, I could see her as that. And mm. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe Keely could, you know, if, you, if you're watching Keely, you know. <laughs> Pencil yeah. it in. And uh, Laura's also said, will the 1920s be an ongoing theme in your book? So talking about book three, are you allowed to tell us anything about book three or is it secret? I, I hope so, because I've mentioned it on a podcast before. So yeah, so book three is, uh, there won't be a 1920s theme in book three. So um, I think that kind of snuck into the murder game. Um, maybe it was just still on my mind from a fatal crossing. I don't know. But book three is, it's another whodunit, which I'm sure will surprise mm -hmm. no one. Um, and it is, it takes place at a wedding in Italy in a castle um so that's I, that's probably all i should say because i want more people to read the murder game at the moment but um but that's yeah, what you can yeah. expect from book three so it's going to be another standalone um and a very different location uh to the first couple of books which i think is probably what excited me about it most and um yeah i'm about three quarters of the way through it so i'm probably about oh, wow. 60 65 000 words into it um and yeah, I'm feeling very excited about it. So that's going to be out next year. And I've... is that the same time as this one, Kate? Is it? Will it be the sort of similar time to this one? Is in similar time of year? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's yeah. that's the plan. I mean, these things do change and move around. Yeah. But um, but yeah, that's it'll be out kind of early next year. I've just seen where the location is in Italy as a question. Um, I yeah. I can tell. Well, I probably no because I don't yet know. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I'll just explain that. So it was going to be in Lake Garda. 
Um, and so we were on, my wife and I were on holiday in Lake Garda last year. And we actually saw, we were visiting a castle, wonderful castle in a little town called Melchisini. And uh, we saw a wedding happening in this castle. And um, I, in a way that is apparently becoming quite morbid, um, was looking at this wedding and just thinking, do you know what, if someone was murdered there, that would be a, <laughs> that would be a fantastic start to a book. Um, so I was going to set it in that castle, but I realized for various boring reasons it just wasn't going to work so i'm setting it in a different part of italy now probably somewhere along the kind of south coast somewhere like that um but that's something that i've decided i need to do literally in the last week or two um wow. so that is why i can't tell you exactly whereabouts in italy it's going to be but it is oh, still well, going to be in italy sounds exciting but i think um sarah said will you use a railway station for a setting for a murder or on a train. I think that it might have been already done. I think that might have been already done. Yeah. <laughs> um uh no, I can't tell you. No, I <laughs> I have <laughs> an idea for a, another crazy mode of transport. Um which mm. may or may not happen, which is why I'm not I'm not going to say anything. Like I don't have the story worked out. I just have the idea of murder on this wacky form of transport. So um but I mean that will be book five so it's years away it won't <laughs> even be book five so yeah we're, we're not even going to talk about that but no i don't have plans to do a murder mystery on a train because yeah how could you top murder on the orient express well that's actually one of my questions is uh do you have a fa favorite crime author um and uh do they or does anybody else inspire your writing so the author who probably inspires my writing the most um and anyone who's listened to me speak anywhere else before will have heard this. So apologies, because I am very much a one tune <laughs> kind of person <laughs> in this regard. But Anthony Horowitz. Um, so just for context, I, I I have read Anthony Horowitz pretty much all my life. Um, like the very first book I bought with my own money when I was a kid was Point Blank, which is the second in the Alex yeah. Ryder series. And I read all the Alex Ryder books all the way through and just, and he's still writing them, which is just amazing when you think about it. So mm -hmm. I read those all through kind of my childhood and my teenage years. And then when I was in my early twenties, he started writing, um, he wrote Magpie Murders and Magpie he started writers. writing his Hawthorne books as well, which are just wonderful. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he kind of moved, if you like, into adult fiction in inverted commas mm. um, as I became an adult. So so I've read uh, I've read him, I'd say, pretty much all my life. Um, I can remember like standing up in my English class when I was like in year six or year seven or mm. something. And you had to talk about what you wanted to be when you were older. Um, and I remember saying I wanted to be an author and I remember citing the Alex Ryder books as an example. And yeah, so he is probably the biggest. And as well, I think, again, this is going to sound like I'm making this up. I'm not. I, I decided I was going to write A Fatal Crossing while I was reading Anthony Horowitz's Magpie Murders. So, um, yeah, he he has probably had the biggest impact on me, mm. both as a reader and a writer. But in terms of the people who have inspired me, um, Obviously, Agatha Christie. You know, I, I came to her quite late. Um, like yeah. I only started properly reading Agatha Christie when I decided I was going to write a Fatal Crossing. But I've read quite a few of them since then. And you know, you're always kind of thinking about about her when you're writing this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, who else do I admire? Janice Hallett. Um, I don't yeah. know if like all of her books are amazing, but The Appeal yeah. in particular, uh, her first yeah. book, just blew my mind like that was just yeah ridiculously good um some screenwriters as well who really really inspire me so Stephen Moffat um so I'm a huge Doctor Who fan and yeah. um I think Stephen Moffat's work on Doctor Who is just something else and Sherlock of course as well and all Love the other ones. So I'm yeah. going to see his play um on Friday actually so I'm looking forward to that um so yeah quite quite a few people yeah. who inspired me over the years no, I really, I really like um, the 
Hawthorne. Well, I loved Magpie Murders and love mm. um, Moonflower Murders as well. Yes, of course. And I just think it's really clever how that you know the two books in one. You know, so you're, you're the story and the story, and it's just like mind blowing. When I read, when I I listened to Magpie Murders, did you? Okay. Yeah, and then it it and I thought, oh, he can't write another one, and then he wrote another one, and I was just he's doing was... a third apparently. There's yeah. um, another on the way. Like just to see inside his head and just work out. How he's it all prolific, comes isn't together. he? He just like writes because he does screen writing as well. He well he did yeah. um, Poirot, yeah. didn't he? And um, that's why right. Midsummer War. Murders and Midsummer yeah, Murders. doesn't yeah. stop. It's amazing. That's, I mean, this is it. This is partly why he's so inspirational. Is you just look at his career and just think, yeah. imagine, <laughs> imagine one day. Oh, you never able... know. See, there you go. You can see this spy. So, um. So Sarah's asking, are you going to to any book? Have you got any festivals or book events booked up for the year? Booked up for the year. I didn't mean to have that. All the time. <laughs> um, so at the moment I'm doing Bristol, I think it's Bristol Crime Fest, it's called. Um, oh, and that is in that's in May. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, hoping to do a few others, although I haven't got them booked in just yet. Um so I'm sure we'll hopefully find out over the next few months. Um, I went to Bloody Scotland last year. And for those oh, who yeah. don't know, that is the name of a festival. <laughs> That's not just <laughs> Bloody Scotland. Um, yeah, I went to Bloody Scotland last year, and that was that was a huge amount of fun. So I'd love to do that again. Um, I missed Harrogate last year, but I'm, I'm very keen to make sure I go to wow. Harrogate this year. Um, yeah, so Bristol's the only one that I'm booked in to do at the so moment. I'll that one out because that's nearer me because I mm. know lots, lots of people in the group, you know, a lot of the group are from the north. So yeah. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the south contingent oh, down here. <laughs> yeah, I'm the southern <laughs> one. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, but hoping to do a few more. So, um, I mean, I, I do always make lots and lots of noise on Twitter and Instagram when I mm. get okay. you know, yeah, asked so to if... do things. So, yeah, keep an eye. Um, yeah, follow Tom I'll if you want to it. know where, where he's off to, where, he, where he's going. Yeah, I'll be around. Um, I'm going to look at my questions. So, <laughs> that's got so many. to. Um, wow. So, is there anything that you've read recently that you'd recommend to people watching this evening? Yeah. Um, and I gave you the heads up on this one because it's the question <laughs> of everybody who thinks, oh, yeah, I know yeah. loads of books, but then you what forget. What have I read recently? Um, I was lucky enough to read an early copy of Janice Hallett's The Mysterious Case of the Alperton Angels, her third mm -hmm. book, which yeah. is just as mind-blowing as her first two, and I would... I would strongly recommend. Um, there's a book called The Chase, which came out in paperback last week, I think. Um, it's by an author called Ava Glass. Um, so it was out last year in Harback under a different name. It's called Alias Emma. And I read it while I was on oh, holiday wow. last summer. And it was potentially the best book I read last year. And it's just come out in paperback called The Chase. It is about, it's a spy novel. Um, and... It's about a, a young MI6 agent called Emma Makepeace who uh, is given the assignment. She is given the assignment of escorting uh, a high value target across London uh, on foot from the east side of London to the MI6 headquarters in the west side of London. Um, and they've got to do it without being seen by any CCTV cameras because the CCTV cameras have been hacked by uh, well, by an enemy force and imagine trying to cross the yeah. entire city of London without being seen um, and there's a ruthless hit squad after them and she has one night to get this target um, to MI6 before they're caught and killed and it is just ridiculously good so Ava herself worked with spies um I, I was about to say she worked with mi5 i think that's right but it could be wrong so don't quote me on yeah. that but she worked with spies herself so she has a ridiculously in-depth knowledge of this world and how it all works so yeah please do make sure to read that that's called yeah, the chase that amazing mm, it's really good i think it has been optioned for tv as well um and it's the first in the series there are going to be more um oh, so right. it's a good time to to read that um, what else have I read recently? I was lucky enough to read um, Rob Rinder's The Trial, which is oh, coming out. Oh, I've got that out. to read. Is it good? It is so good. So <laughs> I'm, I've never really, not because I don't like them, but I've just never got round to reading kind of any courtroom thrillers. Um, but I, you know, I got sent this um, in the post by my publisher to read and it was just wonderful. I read that before Christmas and um, 
I mean, the story with that one, it's uh, there's a, a police officer, very popular, very high profile, profile police officer who is murdered very publicly, poisoned inside the old Bailey. And um, everyone thinks it's this one person who he, you know, he put away years ago and has just been let out out of prison. And, uh, you know, everyone thinks it must be this guy. And the story is about the this young uh, lawyer who is assigned to protect this guy and act as his defense. And of course, as you might expect, everything is not quite as it seems. And um, yeah, that's coming out in June. And I enjoyed that tremendously. So that is that is well worth pre ordering. I would really recommend that. I think it's gonna be really quite big. Oh, that sounds really good. I've got that one on. I think I've got it on Kindle to read. So I think that one I'll might definitely be definitely give it a read. It's really bumped, good. Bumped up the list. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, there you go. So the the chase, the trial, and the mysterious case of the Appleton Angels. They are my. I my really three love most, the Appleton yeah. Angels. I thought it was really clever. I, it's I, amazing, I, isn't it? Yeah. 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 No. Very. If you like, I think I like her the books with the the sort of context of the how she uses the emails and the you know the all it's just really clever way. very very clever yeah yeah and and I read and I think I heard her do an interview to say that she writes it all separately it's like it's not like she writes it all in bits and then puts it together at the end and right. I can't remember, and that just seemed like I don't <laughs> know how that would work <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, you do hear of authors doing it, you know, kind of writing just to make sure they get the words down, writing the yeah. bit of the story that they're most excited about on that day and then stitching it all together in the edit. I mean, it sounds like a bit of a nightmare to me, yeah. to be honest. But, uh, but yeah, whatever whatever works, I suppose. I mean, well, I guess so, yeah, on. that's what the thing, isn't it? It's like, yeah, so, mm. um, so just before we go, because I see it's nearly eight o'clock, which is the time's gone so quickly. Oh, my. Um, how long did it take you to become sort of published from, you know, so if anybody's watching tonight, have you got yeah. any sort of tips about, you know, what you did and what you'd recommend or what you wouldn't do? <laughs> <laughs> um, something, I guess the timeline for me. So, so I got that Magpie Murders for Christmas. I can't remember which year it is now. I was about 24 or something at the time. And I read it over Christmas. I decided in January I was going to have a go at writing my book. I spent six months researching and plotting it out and planning um and I went as well in that time to happens to to go to a talk about how to get a literary agent because I knew I'd need to do something like that mm -hmm. um so I spent six months doing all of that I spent 18 months um writing it and polishing it and getting it ready to to try and submit to some agents um I I was really lucky I managed to sign with an agent quite quickly so it took me mm -hmm just shy of a month to sign with an agent wow. um but i mean i guess that's i guess that's the tricky bit that everyone everyone kind of always asks how how do you get an agent um i think my advice on that one would be if there are events that you can go to um where you can hear agents speaking about the process and what mm -hmm. they like and what they don't go to those because you know i'd say i was at a festival in oxfordshire called called wilderness festival and they had a literary tent and this agent was speaking in there I spent an hour listening to her talking about what she likes and what she doesn't. And that just completely informed my strategy um, for, for pitching to an agent. I, I mean, she gave an amazing piece of advice, which is if you've just spent two years writing your book, why wouldn't you um, put the same amount of effort into trying to get it published, which really, really oh. stuck with me, actually. Um, but yeah, so to go to those talks, listen to them. Um, uh, if you're on Twitter, follow as many agents as you can well not as many as you can so I'm probably making this more confusing than it needs to be <laughs> so you need a short list of agents that you want to go to yeah. um, and the way to work that out is you need to make sure you're targeting agents who uh, who are interested in what you're offering there is no yeah. point sending your book out to just any agent whose email yeah. address you can find you need to make sure if you're writing fantasy or if you're writing crime you're speaking to agents who cover fantasy and crime. Yeah. Um, I think so come up with a list, work out how they want to receive your book, work out what they like and what they don't. Follow them on Twitter because quite often they will tweet, I'm open to submissions, I'm closed to submissions, and that can mm -hmm. be really helpful. So that you make sure your you know your pitches are are being received. Yeah. Um, and just do as much research as you can and you know put as much effort into preparing your pitch for an agent 
as you did into writing the book if you can because yeah, yeah. That's, that does sort of make sense in a way but I guess mm. it's something that people think I've done it now off it goes and that's sort yeah of it. exactly you know yeah. I've seen people on Twitter just sort of saying right okay I've I, this is a real tweet I saw someone said I've I've written the first three chapters of a book can anyone recommend a good agent for me and I've just face palmed <laughs> like you know it's like you need to research the process and you need to understand mm. what the age which agents you should be speaking to that's your yeah. first step and then how do they want to receive your book what are they looking for are they even open for submissions at the moment like you've yeah. got to you've got to gather as much information about that as you possibly can yeah because um, if you just wing it and just send your book out to any agent whose email address you can find it's it's going to be deleted it's not even going to be read so just no. arm yourself with as much knowledge as you can yeah no that sounds like really good advice and um actually sarah says thank you very much about advice about agents so thank you for that very welcome sarah well thank you so much tom um so the murder game i'm going to get it out again now so is out now um it is a fantastic read i finished it last night and um as i said i did not guess who the um who the murderer was so thank you very much <laughs> i'm really glad you i would say that not quite often i mean i think it's sort of a bit of agatha isn't it when you you know when you think the um victim sort of has it coming <laughs> well yeah i mean you've got to i mean yeah yeah, you don't, I mean, yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation i think but, <laughs> it um, is a whole other conversation but yeah definitely in this, this victim one definitely had it coming he definitely did and and it's it's totally intriguing going through the book and finding out all the 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 reasons why you know why he's such a, a unlikable character and yeah and yeah and there's plenty of reasons that's all i'm gonna say <laughs> um Brilliant. laura says thank you very much she'll be exploring later so yeah so thank and you. also um fatal crossing is behind me on the shelf there. yes strategically placed um <laughs> But thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we have got um, another two events this week, which I'm trying to find where I wrote down. So on Wednesday, Kaz is going to be interviewing Ellie Griffiths and Nico Wolf. Um, and on Thursday, Kaz is also going to be interviewing Katie Brent. Um, so, yeah, so we've got a busy week on um the, on the channel this week so um yeah join us if you can and thanks again tom for joining us and good luck with um the murder game and and we'd love to talk to you about book three when when the destination is decided destination and name is decided <laughs> yeah well indeed uh thank you and thank you for having me this is uh it's been a lot of fun great thank you thanks tom thank you very much cheers good night night everybody bye, bye.